soon after man had proved that he could sustain himself in the air, it became evident that if an airplane could be controlled in flight without a pilot, it could become a new and potent weapon. What has come to be known as a guided missile is the result of the exploration and development of this idea. Let's look back over the years and review the meager beginnings of this new weapon. This is probably the first pilotless aircraft ever built in this country. It was powered by an eight-cylinder engine and provided space and fuselage for a bomb and a stabilization unit. The unit provided control during flight and was preset before launching. The first successful test took place at Long Island, New York in September of 1916. World War I came to an end, however, before the flying bomb could be employed in combat. As a result of these experiments, the project was continued at Carlson Field, Florida. The flying torpedo evolved from modifications of the flying bomb. A simple wing assembly and an airplane engine were bolted around a torpedo frame. There were failures even to a modern version of the one horse shea. But in October 1919, the flying torpedo was successfully launched and accompanied in flight by a DH-4 for a distance of 16 miles. Remote control of an airplane in flight was now an accomplished fact. The disarmament conference, which followed World War I, produced economies which severely hampered research and development of guided missiles. However, as the years passed, great strides were made in the design and stability of aircraft. At the same time, comparable progress was being made in the field of electronics. As a result of these two factors, it became possible to fly this obsolete aircraft by remote control. This is the first craft to be modified. And this is the bulky control equipment the parent plane had to carry. As target drones, these planes provided invaluable information to those concerned with control guidance. At the same time, they pointed up the necessity for more accurate anti-aircraft fire control systems. By 1939, this small, compact, cheaply produced target drone became available. Then with the start of World War II, the use of radio-controlled aerial targets for advanced gunnery training was increased. This pilotless target launched from a specially developed catapult and remotely controlled with high frequency radio provided a method of training more realistic and more effective. Special techniques were required to prevent over controlling. But with this remote control, it became possible to simulate a high altitude bombing attack, a torpedo attack or a dive bombing attack. The impact of war heightened interest in the offensive use of drones. Remote control guidance was then applied and tested in assault drones and glider bombs, called GLOMs. Basically, the GLOM was a modified army glider capable of carrying a 325-pound depth charge. It had takeoff and release control. Such a missile could be guided from a plane several miles away. Television was added for more accurate remote control guidance. With this control, the missile delivered an explosive charge to a target, but use of GLOMs had several disadvantages. They were too slow, and the controlling plane was vulnerable to anti-aircraft gunfire. Greater speeds were necessary. Remote control devices were being developed for control of free-falling general-purpose bombs. Wings and an airplane engine were built around a 1,400-pound bomb. Known as the Bug, this unit included a television camera and transmitter and was launched from a specially built automobile. It provided flight speed in an extremely short distance. The car's driver operated a release lever mounted on the launching posts. After takeoff, control was maintained from an accompanying plane. 
the missiles television camera and able the bomb director to fly the unit as though he were actually in it three gyroscopes help to stabilize the unit a speed of about one hundred eighty miles per hour was possible but these units were too expensive and required cumbersome equipment they therefore were not made operational however they gave us valuable experience in launching and remote control a different approach was made to provide an inexpensive and easily produced missile a set of thirteen foot wings was bolted to a general purpose two thousand pound bomb a plane would carry the missile releasing it within some miles of the target enabling it to glide to the objective in some models television was added to the controls this in effect put the bombardier in the bomb itself each was radio controlled in both azimuth and range it was used with some success against the u-boat pens in france and some german cities but this glide bomb had three disadvantages control by television limited its use to clear daytime weather the missiles low speed made it vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire and its wing mounting slowed down the airplane making it vulnerable electronic homing systems were added to the principle of the glide bomb this new improvement was called the bat that was designed to carry a 1,000 pound bomb its total weight 1,600 pounds it was 10 feet long its wingspan measured 12 feet furthermore many types of planes could be easily modified for use with bat the operation was simple it was air launched within gliding distance from the target along a predetermined path it was locked electronically on the target prior to launching the control system continued homing the missile straight to the target this enabled the launching aircraft to leave the area immediately after launching this was the first completely automatic guided missile of the glide bomb type it was used with good effect in the South China Sea area its greatest limitation was its slow speed which made it vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire remote control for general purpose bombs was tried without the use of wings this development was called Azon basically Azon was a free-falling 1,000 pound bomb instead of the normal rigid tail assembly movable radio activated control surfaces were substituted a flare was added to the tail to assist the bombardier during the drop the control surfaces provided correction in deflection or azimuth only which is the reason for the name of this guided missile the Azon Azon was carried in normal bomb racks and used during the summer of 1944 in the European, Pacific, and Burma theaters of operation. These scenes show its use on 30 December 1944 in Burma against long, narrow targets such as bridges, trestles, and railroads. You can see the flare, which is aiding the bombardier in guiding the bomb. Against such targets, Azon was 10 times more accurate than conventional bombs. This particular target is in the Mandalay area. It is the Tongup Bridge. Here a single aircraft is dropping four Azon bombs. But the Azon guidance had disadvantages. Its use was limited to fairly clear weather. When the bombing plane was above 30,000 feet, control at the base part of the trajectory was difficult. A straight course had to be maintained by the plane until impact of the missile, during which time the plane was vulnerable. Another attempt was made. It was a development from the pilotless aircraft principle. This was the Weary Willie. 
The tempo of our air assault on Europe left us with a number of heavy bombers no longer suitable for combat. Every inch of armament and crew space was replaced with TNT. Guidance was by radio from an accompanying aircraft. This represented 10 tons of TNT, 10 times more explosive power than during our tests with assault drones. But now, a large airplane could be remotely controlled. The aircraft was taken off in a normal manner by a pilot. After reaching altitude, control was transferred to the mother plane, and the pilot in the Weary Willie bailed out. Here, in this actual photography of one of the 19 missions from an English air base, you see the bomber responding to the simple control. Some of these missions were dispatched against German installations in France, but they had only a slight degree of success. Intense anti-aircraft gunfire made accompanying planes vulnerable, and better controls were necessary to attain the goal of an effective guided missile. The geographical location of Germany was ample reason for German concentration of research effort on surface-to-surface -surface guided missiles. As early as 1936, a secret research and development center for both guided missiles and jet propulsion was set up at Pinamunda. Here, the best German scientists, assisted by thousands of workers, ultimately produced two of the most devastating weapons of World War II the V-1 missile and the V-2 rocket. The V-1 was 25 feet long with a wingspan of 17 feet. It weighed nearly two and a half tons and carried a 2,000 pound warhead. A pulse jet engine enabled the V-1 to attain a speed of 400 miles an hour. Its range was about 150 miles, cruising at a relatively low altitude. Its control system was set to launching. This rubble is evidence that the V-1, although a crude guided missile in the light of recent developments, was a very effective weapon. Even though concentrated anti-aircraft fire and fast fighter planes destroyed many of them before they reached their targets. The first V-2 was launched against England in September 1944. But the Germans, too, experienced failures. This missile differed from the V-1 in many ways. It was 46 feet long, 6 feet in diameter, and weighed approximately 14 tons. It was propelled by a liquid fuel rocket, which consumed 9 tons of propellants within the first minute of flight. The flight course of the V-2 was also predetermined and the control system set prior to launching. A few seconds after launching, its speed was 3,500 miles per hour, its flight angle 43 degrees. A fuel cutoff controlled the range. From point of fuel cutoff, the V-2 coasted on target at supersonic speed. Arrival of the missile prior to its sound wave greatly hampered the development of countermeasures for this missile. Of the 3,000 launched against England, only 50% landed within the greater London area. From the German missiles, we gained information which spurred our efforts for further improvement. As an example, four months after the first German V-1, we launched the first American model. This was known to American forces as the JB-2 and the Loon. After further development, this missile has been modified and it differs from the German in that ours has radio control. Its course can be altered at will while in flight.
have progressed since our early 1916 efforts, but there is still much work to be done, much improvement to be made toward the goal of the effective guided missile. As a result of past experience implemented by constant research, this goal is rapidly being approached.